Welcome to the Hayworth Theater and the Dumbledore Tapestry, whatever the fuck this place is called, in the prestigious heroin district of downtown Los Angeles. We welcome you once again, and it's always my absolute joy to say the words, Harmon Town is now in session. Thank you. Everybody reach over and put your right hand in the lap of the person next to you and just rub it around. Except for church. Then give it both hands. Let's bring out our game master, Spencer Crittenden, everybody. And once in a while, a mayor is required. Let's give it up for the mayor of Harmontown, Dan Harmon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gratitude rap. I'm thankful for that. I thank you. All right. <laughs> that was it? Yeah, sometimes, you know, remember uh, Six Degrees of Separation, like uh, the Donald Sutherland monologue about how great art is about knowing when to take the uh, drawing away from the child. <laughs> Like people look at a Jackson Pollock and they go, I could do that. Well, you could, you could start to do it, but you'd keep doing it until you fucked it up. <laughs> Pollock got drunk, fell asleep. Genius. So you were feeling less Pollocky or more Pollocky about that rap? Well, I'm feeling like on point about my Pollock curation in terms of myself. I was like, mm, gratitude rap, and then I'm like, fuck it. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how comfortable I am as comptroller of how thin and well-shaven and your haircut, like yeah, you're, looking, uh, you're looking like the sexy version of Dan Harmon. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Well, I mean, look, I, the, I, the, the paradox is always gonna be that like all handsome people, I don't care <laughs> about looks anymore. I'm over it. How, how, how many abs do you think that you currently have? <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I, I think I have two standard abs um, uh, that are dripping over my belt. <laughs> and then another two backup retro abs that are actually my breasts. <laughs> uh, I'm working on, working on reducing them into maybe a, more of an abdominal <laughs> muscle. I, don't, I, don't, I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't changed my diet, which I, I, I do want to say to, you know, my tribe, uh, guys that look like me, um, probably maybe at, so, the, so, at the risk of offending so you. So you, Russell Crowe. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm sure I lead a sedentary pack of uh, quote-unquote alphas. Uh, <laughs> the quotes are theirs. We're meta-alphas. We're very self-loathing. Those quotes actually count as abs. <laughs> The air quotes are my <laughs> fingers rippling. We have carpal tunnel from the air quotes uh, when we flatter ourselves. Um, you could, we could hang from a doorway uh, yeah. by our air quotes. <laughs> Nothing is sincere. All is ironic. Um, but we're fat. And, uh, and I would just say to those guys, not a, I'm, not a, I'm not mistaking myself for a fitness guru, but I will say we always think diet and exercise and like... Diet seems like the easier thing because it's like, oh, well, I don't eat a cheeseburger. That's easier than do doing a sit-up. And I will say, from I, I don't want to give bad advice. We're all dealt different genetic cards and stuff. But I so far don't tell Dave Klein I said this. My trainer slash fan that I met at the drawing room and um, the. the <laughs> <laughs> Is he here or is that oh, just no, somebody knowing? That was a, that was a, that was a, a Kleinel ganger. Um, Doppel, Doppelkleiner. Doppelkleiner? Doppelkleiner. We'll, 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 we'll funny that up in post. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is only the West Coast broadcast, if you're listening. We, <laughs> we clean it up by the East Coast. We've removed De Niro. Uh, um, we we, we had to be funnier three hours ago. <laughs> uh, but I was, I was just going to say, just if you're curious, if you're like me and you're like, well, I definitely don't want to do two things. I don't want to exercise and I don't want to diet. 
so I, 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 like I will say from my experience, it turns out, even though this wouldn't seem this way, the exercise is the easier thing because if you do it, you can still eat like shit. Like I'm still eating like shit. Like I was just in New York and I was just like inhaling. I just like, you know, blackout drunk. I looked at the photo roll. I'm like, why, why do the police keep not arresting me? Why are they taking pictures? The, 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 and, and who are these people? This, that guy's pissed and oh, this guy seemed nice. But it's like, oh, that's urine. And like, like, like me, like a video, I found a video of me peeing just somewhere in the darkness. What does this have to do with your diet, Dan? Well, guess what? I didn't stop at the Albertsons and get kale on the way home. I, 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 I followed Fred Flintstone vapor trails of Bronto Burger cookouts and just wandered into people's living rooms and ate turkey off of their table and... Um, and so, if you do that in 20 minutes on an elliptical a day, you can, you can, you, you'll probably die of like bad things, but you, you, you might, you'll, you'll lose more tummy than if you. What am I doing, Harmon? Stop! <laughs> I just thought it was an interesting fact because I never knew, I never knew it would work that way. Never tried exercising before in my life. <laughs> I really haven't. It was, it was, it was called gym class. That was where we were. Cold from the herd, like, 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 the, the, the rope and the and the pull-ups and the, the the even the square dancing. I don't know if that was a bone they were throwing us. Like, like, do you think that was maybe was it was was the square dancing thing like give the people that can't throw a ball a break, let them touch a girl before they become serial killers, or or was it? Fuck these guys that can't throw a ball and are still going to sail through the Fayed system. I want to prove they're monsters, make them touch girls, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to bust them. Was there actually a square dancing in Milwaukee? or where, like, Oh, yeah. For real? That wasn't part of everybody. Well, yeah, this is a generational thing, too. Who, who had square dancing by applause in there? Did you, did you go to some <laughs> no, well, school for the well. sexually confident or something? Or? Everyone had a suit, they had all the kids. We, we did, we called it Cotillion. <laughs> Cotillion and everybody was... Your everybody high school hallway rude. looked like a ventriloquist act. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the guys had to look like Louis Jordan and the women had to look like Audrey Hepburn. And then you, there was a woman that had like uh, castanets and she would teach us like how to do like the rumba and the samba. And like the merengue and shit like that. Like this is when's this gonna come in handy? Turns out it did. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. You can you can you can uh, indirectly bully people on a podcast. <laughs> Learn the but, samba. Uh, so it wasn't choices that made you superior. No, no. It was your breeding. It it was being raised in Orange County. Like they 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 made you be fancy. Privilege. Well, do you want to talk about privilege? I do. <laughs> it profits me every time. Can we, can we talk about you hating being in first class at, 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 in airports? Because I, your tweets against the mint uh, jet blue gave that you a was very... not a jet blue lounge. <laughs> that was a lounge in the jet blue terminal. That you needed but they were very nice about into. it. But you, you were, you're like, this is fucked up. I'm, 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 I'm up in a lounge like a piece of shit, and and you, you're talking shit about being in a first class lounge. I put a positive spin on it too. A lot of people said it was the, it was the best stuff they'd read in a long time. I mean, I got a lot of compliments on that. I really did, and it made me proud. I do like people telling me I enjoyed your tweets. You know, I, it's a, like, and, uh, it, you know, I will say thank you sometimes. I won't just uh, start getting in a tussle with a 17-year-old dressed in a baggy suit disguise with a freaking ink mustache he drew on his face. <laughs> You're a bad writer. Kid, come on. I'm not, I'm not great, but I'm... <laughs> like, you can't even say in a tweet that I'm a bad writer without writing badly. I know that you don't know. You're like adding all these syllables to sound like Frasier. Like, I, I, come on. Like, I'm not, I don't. Is this somebody that works with JetBlue or just a regular person? No, this is, I felt bad. Yeah, JetBlue tweeted and said, <laughs> that's not our lounge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
and, 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 their and, lounge. And, 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 and you, you were very contrite about it. You were very because con- I love JetBlue. They only fly back and forth from New York to LA, right? It's all it is. It's like if, if, if for the rarefied. I'm sure I don't know if people fly JetBlue coach, and if you hate, you have bad experiences in JetBlue coach. I don't know. I I I, I do want to say this. I do, I realized this on the plane. So, now, prepare to admire me. The the. <laughs> Everybody, buckle your admirer belts. A lot of oligarchs. Yeah, I'll say it. I'm an oligarch. I haven't looked it up yet, but it sounds appropriate. Uh, it will undercut our uh, own position with our politics, or I'm sorry, we'll refuse to. I'm a hero for, I forgot why I was admirable. Um, <laughs> I'll, I, I don't care if my feeling about how things should work happens to point to me having to give up some, some stuff. For example, I realized on that plane, having had to do it, but also having been allowed to do it, which I shouldn't have, that first class people should not be allowed to shit and coach. Okay. It says it, it, you should, if you're in first class and the captain's taking a shit, Coach can't come up and take a shit in first class. You get yelled at. They I, can't. Happened to actually, me. actually, they can. If, if if the curtain is halfway unbuttoned, that means you're allowed from from coach uh, to go up into first and take a little take a little first class poop. If the if the if the if, if, the, if the curtain is halfway undone, that means like the, the captain is like like oh no, it's when the uh, the food is going down. If the, back. the curtain is loose, the captain's in the caboose. Uh. <laughs> He's dropping a deuce, but, <laughs> but I couldn't. No, 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 so because if, if, if the flight attendants are bringing the food cart down the aisle, nobody can go back down to the aft lavatory. So you're, you are, by law, by the FFA, to go up and take a first class poop. If okay. the, yeah, if you're being blocked by the, uh, by the food cart. R- okay. Right. Well, maybe I don't feel it. So, because I've been in, I've been on planes so vast, so... How vast were they? That I think, like, that scene from Inception was shot on there where, like, <laughs> you know, where it turns out most of the movie takes place on one level in that weird plane where there's, like, a cafe and there's, like, a bunch of briefcases with uh, hose, hose wheels in them. I, it's something like, plane, plane's so I, big I, I, that I never saw the movie, so I have no idea what you're talking about. Or are you seeing it now without knowing it? The trick isn't to get to see it, to get you to see it. The trick is to convince you you've seen it. I'm taking a poop in the lobby right now and nobody knows that. Um, I've, ju- I've been yelled at for being in first class and taking a poop in like platinum yeah. class. I, I, like I had a guy, fo- I got up, took a poop, walked, did what I always do, walked forward 10 feet and took a poop. And then as I was coming out, a fucking dude followed me back to my seat. An employee of the airline, like, like, like in a little uniform, like, like, which meant he was waiting for me to finish pooping. And then he followed me. I was like, excuse me, sir, you're not supposed to use the bathroom in the air. And I was like, well, you, you were first sitting class. In fr- he said, that's platinum class. And, and I said, well, it was... You know, it's a blue collar poop, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> I didn't say that. I'm a coward. And... All right. Wait, wait, wait. There was, there's a platinum blue collar poop area, but you, you, you didn't use. The... I somehow passed it. I guess like there was like a Hogwarts like like pillar in a train station that you could. That it's it's just like disguised more. It's like more yeah. worked into the you know, the turn the coffee pot, and then there's like a bathroom. I, I just passed it. I just because I'm used to the geography of it. I'm like the bathroom's going to be as far as you can walk, and then you hang a yo. Right. <laughs> and then you do your thing. And that, but I didn't know that like four stockbrokers were like. <laughs> Did that millionaire just put his <laughs> ass on our billionaire toilet? And fill it with whatever fucking high-quality vegan bakery that he didn't even have to eat? Did, did, did I tell you I, I was in San Francisco and I was flying back to L.A. first class and I had, the San Francisco Giants had just won the World Series while we were in the airport. 
So everybody bought everybody a Fernet Branca and a like Anchor Steam. So I, I had 90 drinks, and I got on the plane, sat down, and go, oh shit, I I have to barf. I have to barf. Have we talked about this before? I think you've mentioned it. Yeah, you went yeah, back. Yeah, and, and I went back and puked all over my shoes, but I didn't do it in the fucking front one because that's where the people that fly the goddamn thing are going to have to be. So I went in the back, and I was persona non grata. I was, I was, I was a bad guy because it took me 30 minutes to clean up after yeah. what I fucking did. I was lucky that I, I, I had a little stealth bomber back this time. And Coach, as we all know, for, you know, everyone's going to look at me anyway, even if it's not my poop, they'll all look at me. But I luckily, I just, it was yeah. just like, I, yeah. Like, like, I, I'm, I'm six foot, predator shit. I'm six foot four almost, and I, like, I, I'm like tall, and the, the, the back laboratories are very short, and I couldn't get down close enough to the thing to, to like successfully puke it. Yeah, I don't know how you would do So that, I yeah. just basically just leaned my head over <laughs> and vomited a gallon of Fernet Branca and <laughs> Acre Steam all over the whole building. Oh. And then people were, hey, whoa, what's up? Like, and, they, and they knew that I was just fucking from front, like first class. And I was like, yeah, you don't wanna, you don't, you don't wanna be in here right now. Yeah. Hey, Spencer, how's it going over there? Hey guys, Chef Kevin here. <laughs> I like it without the without the blanket. I thought it was I thought it was funny with the blanket, but the the desk it's very. I like, you, you, are, are, are your desks gonna get more and more elaborate? Yeah. As this show goes on, I'm gonna keep adding drawers <laughs> and opening. Them. Are, you, is, are you just gonna be like the, the King's Speech at some point? Like write write a whole thing. I'm gonna be like the King's Speech at some point. I hope you know that at the end of this mystery, we're not going to be surprised that you were the ghost. Yeah. You're the only one that was here when our van broke down. Obviously, you're here looking for the gold and using projectors and... Yeah. Yes. You're right that now no one is going to be surprised. Why, I, I'm the fancy joke. guy. Why don't I have candles up here? Do you want some of my candles, man? No, no, no I, 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 I don't want any of your candles. I want you to have all the candles. Thank just, one, you. just one more thing, but Jet, Jet Blue and I want to bring on our guests. I, 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 because I like them and I want to praise them like, for their, because all the people are always friendly and they're always, look, I'm biased and this doesn't make people good, but they're, they, see, they, I, there's an overwhelming percentage of JetBlue flight attendants that, that recognize me and say that they like my work. And uh, I'm sorry, but that makes you a good airline in my book. And I have that rapport then with them because I feel like, well, now they know, they know they like me, so now I can be gregarious and it's just fun. And then they do the thing where they put the, 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 uh, the cart in front of the thing because the, the, the bathroom, the captain's got a, the thing. And I, I got up to use the bathroom and the flight attendants are leaning on the thing and they look and they go, oh, and I go, oh. Captain taking a deuce, and uh, and they're like, yeah. <laughs> this feels more sincere and honest. They're like, it's okay, he can say it. I bet if I was a welder, they'd be like, I think you mean he's shitting. <laughs> Let's bring out our guest, Judd Apatow! We'll never know how funny my bit was going to be introducing Judd Apatow. Well, Judd, 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 go back. Let's, let's, we're going to do a read. We're going to do a redo. All right, so Dan, uh, yeah, yeah, Jet Blue. Uh, it's not the best. It's not All the right. worst. Uh, but well, uh, anyways, enough about me. I'm tired of hearing myself talk. You know, when I started this podcast, it was all about me. <laughs> But then I thought, what about the voices we don't get to hear? <laughs> and I, it was then that I've decided to start using my podcast as a signal boost for the unheard voices of America. Please welcome Judd Apatow. <laughs> Thank you. Pretty funny intro. <laughs> They, they went for it. You'll edit out the first part? Uh, we're going to have to. Yeah, I guess. Well, you know. No, no. What, we, what Judd, you don't know, is we're going to do four more uh, iterations <laughs> of this. 
<laughs> this is this this is the whole time you're on stage. Uh, this show's heavily edited, right? Yeah, yeah. I panicked when you, you, you arrived in the green room and you're like, so what's the plan? And I was like, uh-oh. No. <laughs> uh-oh. How come you get a stand for your microphone? Oh, yeah. Yeah, wh wh where, where, was, where is Schraub's weird lectern that we had last what time? If, what if my arms are tired? <laughs> There's one. We, we, last That's time a power move to have your own stand <laughs> and deny it to your guests. It's kind of, there's one over there, but it's actually, I, now, that I, now that I donated mine, yeah. it's, it's not only did I get to high road, but it's actually better not to have one. It, it, that's, that thing is a... Do you oh, feel yeah, powerful? I, I don't need it either. Let's go standless. Yeah. <laughs> How many pianos are there? <laughs> Seems Free. like a complicated way to hold a microphone. And you know the real irony, zero typewriters. <laughs> no, there's one typewriter. Okay. <laughs> Wait, he, he's, he's got a stand too. How you... well, someone fucking told me that before. <laughs> and we don't even want them. It was right here like the whole them. time. And you moved the piano. I hate them. I hate stands. I never realized how insulting they are. Like, like, oh, can I hold that for you? No, no. Thank you for... That was, that was so much... The drink holder. Thank you for the drink holder. <laughs> <laughs> do, do, you, do you play a little piano, Jed? Uh, I only know one thing. Uh, here we go. Yeah, lay it on us. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> now, within the category of people that learned anything on piano, that's lazy. <laughs> because you stopped. That's like stopping shaving a haircut and never learning two bits. <laughs> You're like, okay. <laughs> he just, but he was yes. improvising. I figured yes. that out. He inverted the first part. Back when he was eight, his mom was like, Judge, if you... No, Mom! It's hard! I'm oh, you, tired you, of it. You just wanted a microphone stand. I thought you wanted, like, like, a, like a piece of furniture. That, that could have saved me a whole lot of calories. Well, you did get him a piece of furniture. <laughs> you're, you're just like a Victorian lord over there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this desk is outstanding. Well, I'll start by asking, probably, it might be a question you've been asked before. Can everyone in the building have a job? Yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, do you do you have to? You know, it's like, oh, is your interview going to be about what it's like to be uh, uh, famous? Uh, is that is that is that does that something that worries you? What it's like to be famous? No, to be interviewed by somebody that's just going to do that instead of uh, uh, like 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 talking about you as if you're an inhuman demagogue and like wondering, asking like, what, what's it like? And are there? <laughs> no, I like it. I like okay, it. Okay. <laughs> I, this is my level of fame, which is I, I was at Disneyland, and somebody said to me, they said, you know, if someone asks for your autograph at Disneyland, they will send security over, and they will let you cut the lines the rest of the day. You know, so if like Tom Hanks goes, it's a security problem if people start asking for autographs. Right. So I think it's if two people ask for your autograph, security will walk you around the rest of the day and let you cut the lines. So the next time I went to Disneyland, I wore a 40-year-old virgin T-shirt. <laughs> And I did not get asked for an autograph one time. I was looking in people's eyes. So you may have a dysmorphia about my level of, uh, of success and that awareness. That is an insane, distracting uh, uh, policy on their part. I mean, I thought, like, it, like it, does, it, that, how does that make you feel when you hear that? Does that make, that makes, fills me with panic. Like, oh, it makes me so happy because then I, I figured out how to crack the code, which is I bring my wife. Right, that's then, one uh, person. And then it's easier, but it doesn't work solo for but me. How do, you, how do you verify that you have to walk up to somebody that's an employee there and say, hello, my name is Judd Apatow. I've been, I've been asked for two autographs. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to bring and, up, no, I'm have in a real hurry. A for the, yeah, yeah. 
You know, you have to be the lamest person in the world to do it. But when you're cutting the lines, it's so worth it. Like every oh, yeah. second well, of yeah, it. Well, yeah, I, I is mean, worth we'd it. almost do anything to cut a line, I would imagine. But that's why it's like, it's like, yeah. Because people like go in wheelchairs. They put on fake casts yeah. oh. and go in wheelchairs to cut lines. Oh. So you got to do what you got to do. You know, it's cool now. Like, I get, because I'm not famous, but <laughs> I, I'm, uh, I, like, I'm occasionally on whose line is it anyway? Everybody that everybody that works at uh, Disneyland is 24. They all are theater kids. They all took an improv class. <laughs> so church, my girlfriend and I, we went there and we were like way more famous than you there because it was VIP. There are, VIP. There are like certain spaces where you're famous, but only in like that room. Right. You know. Yeah, it was good because yeah, but that's gonna stop in three years because they're all going to be too old and no one's going to know who the fuck I am yeah. but they're going to know who you are but you have to not you have to wear the right shirt I have to wear a 40 old version t-shirt <laughs> I'm, in, I'm impressed and uh, uh, yeah that, that, that it's not an out of swarm because my panic would, I would imagine imagining th life in your shoes would be like well it, it's there it's that it's that can I have a job thing like it's all like like, like you're your your brand is that you can give people movies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like it just seems kind of dangerous. Like I, I'm only famous for. Oh, he might yell at you if he's drunk. <laughs> uh, like, like and, 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 but like to be to be kind of like that. That's that's part of your brand. Like like uh, that that would be not only like an invitation for a lot of like. Uh, 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 th kind, kinds of conversations that would yeah. make me uh, very anxious. Well, like at Sundance is a bad place for me to go. <laughs> because if I walk up and down the street in Sundance and everyone's kind of just looking for anyone who makes movies, you know, they spot you and now they hand you like memory sticks which have a screenplay on them. Oh. Which you really can't put a strange memory stick into your computer. Right. <laughs> That yeah, could be anything, really. That, that might be anything. That might, that might be something awful that goes yeah. on your computer. I told, I've told this story on this podcast before, but the, 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 it's, I, was, I did a panel, and a girl came up, and she said, Mr. Harmon, I am such an admirer of your work. Like, um, do you think, I, could, can I please, like, I know this is crazy, but I, I just always wanted to be a writer, and I, I, I like I, I, you're a role model to me, and and if you, it, it would just mean a lot if you would sign uh, my screenplay. And, and, and I'm like, oh, you know, no problem. Like, you're, I, like, of course I'll do this thing that you're telling me is crazy. <laughs> I think, and, and, and like, so I take it and I sign it, and she just goes, and if you could read it, that'd be great, and walked away. <laughs> Now, do you ever, for the hell of it, read a stranger's screenplay? Like, would you ever just read that? I, I had to. I had to open that one because because my religion dictated that I needed that girl to be a bad writer. And that, <laughs> that, like, because what if she's good and I and I just thrown it in the garbage because I felt like yeah. like how dare she? <laughs> so I was like, now I have to fucking read it, and I'm like three pages, and I'm like, yeah, that's pretty sweaty. Yeah. <laughs> Judd, how did uh, like Kamel and Emily come to you with uh, the big sick? Uh, were you pals with them before that? Well, no, not at all. I I went to Atlanta, uh, no, not Atlanta, uh, Austin. Haven't to, seen it. To, to show, <laughs> it's very good. Uh, to show uh, the first episode of Girls, and uh, Dave Rath, uh, who is the manager for Pete Holmes, yeah. said, "Will you do Pete Holmes' podcast?" And I said, "Who's Pete Holmes?" And <laughs> And because Pete Holmes popped out of a bush yeah. and went, he's an experience! <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I love Pete Holmes. <laughs> but at the time, I, was, I wasn't doing stand-up, and I didn't really know who anybody was. I was really out of the loop. And so I showed up, and it was uh, Pete Holmes' was interviewing Kumail and uh, Chris Gethard, uh, and I think Todd Barry. And, uh, I love Todd, he's we, great. We met on stage, and then it was just really weird that over the next few years, I, I produced Chris's uh, one-man show, uh, and, uh, and then I'm now working with Pete on Crashing, and worked with Kamel. So it was the most productive podcast uh, of all time. And then yeah. he came in and he pitched me this <laughs> crazy story about uh, Emily and uh, the coma and all of it, and I just thought, I'm ne no one has a story that good. Like, everyone... 
no one's like yeah. anecdote of their life. Yeah, it's is just dark good. enough too because it yeah. like makes you have to wonder. Well, if I had one date and then <laughs> it's like yeah. it's like it's like a it's like a thing that feels just a little too dark to yeah to to make jokes about uh, or that you don't want to go there, which is like always a you know, good and thing. he said you know I fell in love with her while she was in the coma. Right. And I thought, well, that seems like a good movie. But at the time, I didn't really even know Kamel. I didn't really, I, but I thought this is a great does idea. It, does anybody really know Kamel? <laughs> <laughs> you can't know Kamel. <laughs> <laughs> you can only know my horrible impression of him. <laughs> Whoa, I've never heard one of those. That's pretty good. I worked with him for four years. I, I, mean, I don't have any impression. I cannot do a Kamal impression. No, so we think, you know how every, like, if, if you're a bad impression, I'm sure James Adomian d has a different fucking process than me for his impressions. But, uh, like, you know, like, if you want to, if you're, if you're not, if you don't do impressions, but you want to try to do one, you, there's, like, a phrase or a word yeah. that you, that you get, that gets you started. Like, for Kumail, it's, it's, it's cunt, because that's how he says can't. Would you, what? Oh, I'm like, sorry. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's I think right. it's funny. Like I thought, well, I would have done. Oh, I what did you call it. me? By the, yeah. I'd like to hear an extended Kamel impression. Like, can you keep going? No, I don't want to because be, it's, be, be it's, Kumail, it drifts in and out of. Be of Kamel at a, like, a, a, yeah. a Burger King drive-thru and try to order something as Kamel, but you cannot use the word "cunt." <laughs> <laughs> you have to use every word but that. Now you have given people opportunities that change their life. I don't know about that. <laughs> It doesn't look like a changed life, but I'm still I'm still working at the Apple Store. <laughs> this this but, this used to be an Apple Store, yeah. but his, it was pretty his, much his, this. His desk wasn't always an Edwardian, beautifully enameled desk. Like he's really moved up. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, but you you what? How much of you pays that forward? Because as we were discussing backstage. The, uh, your term was the patient zero. I was using. Uh, neither of these phrases are going to be flattering to him. Uh, but Ben Stiller is like that. You call them the patient zero. I call them the the Lestat. Um, uh, ben, Ben, like, let's use the term very loosely because you're 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 a self starter, and you, he but he, he he discovered plucked you, whatever phrase you want to use. Like Ben grabbed you, and and it was the Ben Stiller show. Like, you were, what was your title on that? Were you EP? Well, I, no, I was the executive producer, but that was just a funny moment uh, in time. I was, uh, my main job then was I was writing HBO specials for Tom Arnold. And I, I wrote Roseanne's act with her for a year. And I was doing a lot of, like, stand-up specials. Wait, did you write specials. the Tom Arnold special where he does the, uh, my big penis, my big penis. Was that a stand-up special or like he? Well, it was like a it was like a, a, a pre-taped sketch that that, that that did that was part of a special. It could he, it, it could be to the tune of My Sharona, <laughs> my, 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 oh. my big penis. <laughs> my Sharona. I'm weird, not it's weird when you it do right. things that like no one remembers at all. Like there were three Tom Arnold specials. There'd be kind of like a sketch, and then it would turn into like a piece of like Tom trying to solve a problem, like almost like a reality comedy piece. It was called Tom Arnold, The Naked Truth. How many people saw one of those? Oh, damn. Like two people. This yeah. is how fast the culture discards greatness. Yeah. Well, com comedy doesn't age well, but also old people. Like, yeah. they, I mean, this is, it's been old, a while. Old, yeah, right? old people age great. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's their main thing. You know why it's weird? Is I always think, like, that was 20... Uh, six, 27 years ago. What so, was the what was the bits like? Like, wh what would I remember off of that? Well, we went to the mall and Chris Farley. There was a piece about how to pick up women, and we we, we shot Chris Farley walking around a mall hitting on strangers, like with the hidden cameras, oh, so, so when no one knew who Chris Farley so, was. So actual like like candid camera. Stuff. That's what one of the bit one right. of the bits was. And uh, what was and, it on? Like, it, what, it was on HBO. But but I always look at it like this. Like when I was a kid in nineteen seventy seven. 27 years earlier was 1950. So from the Ben Stiller show, from here is 1950. Right. 
Yeah, I know. It's crazy when you realize that. It's, it's like I keep, I keep, I keep thinking, well, you know, Mr. Show was the, is the most recent good yeah. sketch show, and <laughs> like, no, we're all dying. I, just, like, like I, 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 I hung out with Mark McKinney in New York, and uh, as, as like, well, why, why, why do you look so good? And it was like, oh, was like, oh because because we've gotten so old that he's now injured a second phase of his life where he's now he's a handsome old man. <laughs> I hope he doesn't hear that. Um, <laughs> but it's like it's like it's like we th there's so, so, some of, some of our peers are getting handsome again. It's been yeah. so long, yeah. and we're so close to death. Yeah, there. Um, uh, Judd, Judd, I, I've recently become kind of palsy with uh, with uh, Fig. Like, yes, with Paul Fig, and you dress like Paul Fig. Well, well he, no, he dresses better. Yes, because because he has more. Because Paul Fig did not used to wear suits all the time. He used to wear bowling shirts all the time. Yes, he did. And yeah. on a dime, he went suit. Yeah. Just on a dime, like, by the way, starting tomorrow, I will wear a suit every day for the rest of my life. If, if, I, was, I was talking to my girlfriend, uh, like, if we had all the money in the world, we would just dress, like, fancy at all times and, and like, bespoke shit. But Paul does. Like, Paul yeah. really has bespoke shoes and suits. Yeah, and I went the other way, which is about three years ago, I decided that every day of my life, I would wear a black James Purse polo shirt. <laughs> Forever. <laughs> I just got, I just uh, uh, kept wearing Rick and Morty shirts until there were so many people watching it that 20% of the people were Nazis, and then <laughs> <laughs> because it's a good show that's loved by a lot of really wonderful people, it's, and there's good there's good people on both sides. <laughs> But 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 and I was like I can't and now it's, well, I mean, it really was it was it was it wasn't because of that I'm being glib but but uh, um, but it was because actually oh the show's become so popular that I don't want to look like I'm trying doing the this yes. is forty T-shirt thing and so well you weren't at Disneyland so now I just have, I'm, just, I'm just rotating between three Henleys because I finally found out Henleys are slimming that's it but is, this is what we do because we we don't want to exercise we don't really want to eat well and we're just searching for a shirt that makes us look. Kind of shitty. Yeah. <laughs> this is 45 and 50. Yeah. Um, but I want to go back because... Like, this show is brought to you by men's rights activists. <laughs> <laughs> um, the... the it, you, also, let's rewind just a little bit before <laughs> Ben's... Because, because I didn't know that, so my imagining was like... I was picturing Ben plucking you from like... I think you started uh, like when you were in high school. You were your mom was working at a. Uh, uh, gee, Dan, did you read his Wikipedia page? Um, your mom was your mom was working at a comedy club. My, yeah, my parents got divorced, so my mom was seating people at a comedy club because my parents used to own a restaurant, and the guy was the bartender who went on to become like a, a big uh, manager of the like, Tim Allen and Drew Carey. This guy Rick Messina, he opened a. Oh, it, was, a it was Rick. It was Rick, and he opened a comedy club on Long Island. So in the aftermath of this terrible divorce, my mom, who's broke, was just, she was seating people at a comedy club. And uh, th so that was maybe 1982 or something that, that summer. And how I, old were you? And I was, uh, you know, uh, 15 or 14. And right, so you, it was, was kind of like, there's, there's, there's kids these days, it, it would be a podcast now, but it's like, there's that archetype where it's like, there's the... There's the mogul that pays it back, and then there's the there, there's also. But you started as that kind of like self-starting precocious guy yeah. that who, through your mom's job, you were getting like headliners to come and do your interview show that you yeah. did for what AV club in high school or for the, a high school radio station that really didn't even get out of the parking lot, and so <laughs> because what happened is I went to the see all the comedy shows all summer, and it was like Paul Provenza and Jay Leno and people like that. And I just, in my little teenage head, I thought, I need to meet them. How can I meet them? And I had a friend who used to interview rock bands, like R.E.M., like when they first started for the high school radio station. And he's like, maybe you could start a show where you interview comics, and that'll be an excuse to call them. And then I would call them. And uh, I, the first interview I did was Steve Allen. And I, sh I show up. Wow. I didn't have a tape recorder. I literally brought a boom box. <laughs> that had a record function, and I put like the boom box on the table and press record. Was, was Barry Sobel with you? Yeah, uh, at, at that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so that was uh, the, the beginning of it. And then, but that was like, there were no podcasts. There was no right. way to know what anyone thought about anything. And in my head, I'm like, I wish I could talk 
to Harold Ramis and ask right, him about right. stuff. But it was still a it's still an archetype that kind of transcends technology because now that kid would have a podcast. But it is there is a there's an archetype there. Yeah. Like the kid, the precocious kid who's like, please, sir, I'm just yeah. interested in your funny comedy yeah. and the and the 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 people getting a kick out of like, well, I'd be a pretty good person for uh, being on this uh, yeah. this kid's yeah. show and treating him like an equal. And, yeah. and I'm, I just proved I'm a great guy. Like I've, yeah. I've, I've done that for a certain podcast. Of, uh, 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 and like, do you, do you? Never. If people ask me to do it, I know never do it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> the, kid, the kid's like, you did it. I'm just like, fuck off. I don't, do, I don't become, do it. So the, 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 like, the kind of baptismal moment is Ben Stiller doing what he also did for me in Schraub and what he's done for so many that it's kind of crazy that if he wasn't also Ben Stiller and therefore yeah. interesting in different ways, it would be an actually very interesting thing about him that he yeah. that he's that he sees. Like, he has great uh, taste. Yeah, he's just like this frog tongue goes shoom, and just grabs <laughs> the juiciest fly. That's a horrible way of putting it. <laughs> Why do I have to take something wonderful about a guy yeah. that I owe everything to and purposely turn it into the most grotesque thing I can? <laughs> Everything. It, you know why? Is because I started to realize I was flattering myself. Because oh, my my benefactor has great taste. So I I I, I hit like an ear break. Where I was like, no, make it gross and dumb. Well, back then, you know, it was different because comedy wasn't as big. So like Stiller, I think he was on four or five episodes of Saturday Night Live. He was like a writer performer. They kind of didn't let him on the show. How he got on the show is a crazy story, which is. He made a short film, which is a parody of the movie *A Color of Mo The Color of Money*, which is about pool. Yeah, yeah. And he did yeah. a version with John Mahoney, which was bowling. Yeah. And he played Tom Cruise, and John Mahoney played uh, Paul Newman. Yeah, he, he was a really good impressionist. Like he really did. Really well, well, his, weird his, his Tom Cruise was insane. Yeah. And I, no I one was, did Tom Cruise. <laughs> yeah, no one was doing a Tom Cruise impression. Yeah. I was like. I mean, back then people good. were still doing like Jimmy Cagney and stuff. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sp Spiro Agnew. <laughs> And so, so he makes this film, he waits in the lobby at NBC, to, and he sees John Lovitz, and he hands it to him and says, will you show someone at Saturday Night Live? And he did. And then they said, we're going to put it on this weekend. And people loved it, and then he got asked to be on the show. But when he was on the show, he was like, I want to make short films. No one there wanted him to make short films. So he left. Like, he, he quit Saturday Night Live, like, in six weeks. And... He did a show for MTV, and then that didn't go, but had some great like really, a U2 parody that was pretty it, it, it incredible. Was, it was really good. And, uh, and then I met him online at Elvis Costello Unplugged. I was with Dana Gould, and he had met Ben, and we both knew HBO was looking to produce a sketch show. And then uh, Ben uh, and I met. We thought of an idea, and we sold it like two weeks later, and we had known each other for two weeks when the show got sold. Like Everyone thought we were pals forever, <laughs> but we literally just met, but he didn't know that I didn't know how to do anything. <laughs> and did, did, was, was he, did he, he, uh, he got you that EP credit, right? Like, he, he probably, like, fought for you and... Like... I might have had better credits than him oh, at okay. that moment. Oh, okay, yeah, well, if you're doing, you're doing all those specials, that's the, that's I mean, the chapter that I know. It was a mistake, because HBO wanted a sketch show, and then we pitched it for HBO, and HBO started a production company, and they sold it to be the, so they were the producers, so it would air on Fox. So, so Fox had no vetting process of like, these are children. <laughs> they shouldn't have a network show. And suddenly I'm the executive producer from like just writing jokes. But th this is like after like Christopher Guest's like stuff, like, like they, would, they would do their little shorts on, on SNL, right? Yes. So they, yeah. you, they, they, that was already kind of a thing. Yeah. They, but then that became like did that was is that where Mr. Show kind of was it's launched? A, it's, out? it's like it's like the protoplasmic Mr. Show. I mean, yeah. Odenkirk and Cross were on it. Garofalo, Andy Dick, our friend Dino Stamatopoulos was was on it, and uh, and uh, Rob Cohen. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, but it was all done with uh, like a you know we were so naive we didn't know that there was a thing called casting. Mm. <laughs> so when they said who's like in the show, like who's your your troop, Ben and I just sat down in like five minutes, just went, well, Bob and Andy are funny, and Janine's funny, all right. <laughs> and, and, but we didn't know that in town was Jack Black and Will Ferrell and all these people. We just thought, well, who's the funniest people in our group that we love? 
And you hear that, Janine? You, you would have been replaced with Jack Black. <laughs> <laughs> he just didn't know he could. Uh, <laughs> but, but I was like, Ben would have an instinct, like, you know who's hilarious? Bob. And then back then, we were like, okay. Like, we didn't, there wasn't like a corporate process to like, it. it was how, like, how, old, how old were you when that first kicked off? 24. What? Yeah. That's crazy. Hey, I was pretty young at the, uh, uh, <laughs> when I... Uh, blogged. Dan, you're f you're 58. <laughs> Fucking take but it I, easy. I, 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 it's 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 a like Ben's. We we, have, we we refer to this thing called the fraud complex out here. It, it, it's 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 something that I learned early on. Like I I uh, I was dating. Uh, you probably know Tracy Katsky. I was like, yeah. like I was she was it was like my first LA girlfriend. I yeah. think and like um, she, I remember kvetching about something at probably that age and her she also taught you the word convention <laughs> probably yeah but 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 she uh she's like is it like i'm just you know uh, drama queen like like about this and that and she's like fraud complex you have a fraud complex and it, it it runs the industry but but i think ben stiller's fraud complex runs more industry for it's, it's it's like his his ben ben's fraud complex and i hope he wouldn't be offended by that because it's like it's a complex it doesn't mean he's a fraud he's more than proven that but it's a, he's he he was he was born with these parents that uh, you know were they were the the rest of us have these stories about being in our pajamas and running out at the parties and being like oh and here's this little sociopath um, <laughs> let's all pay attention to them the funniest guy in the Midwest and Ben Stiller is the son of these legendary, hilarious, amazing yeah. party animal comedy people who are never going to be outshone no matter what his pajamas look like. And, 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 I, think, and I, I think that we owe that. Yeah. To, to, we, we owe everything to that. But, like, like we owe Better Call Saul to that. We owe everything. Yeah. It's like, like the, the chart of what Ben Stiller being so unsatisfied, being so unable to just go, yeah, nailed it. It, it, that made him quit SNL before yeah. he like drowned in it. It made him like do 13 episodes of a show with you that won an Emmy after it got canceled. <laughs> it made it makes him. It made him at least at that time like he he he, he just always is like oh that person's funny or who do you say is funny like if I hear someone's funny yeah. I just go well fuck that person I'll figure out why later. <laughs> But and then maybe over time I'll go, Dan. What are you doing? Calm down. Go to therapy. Maybe, yeah. maybe someone's funny. Uh, but but I feel like ben, ben would hear someone's funny. He'd go, Oh, what, really? How 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 funny? Can I can I meet them? Like, yeah. I, can I help them? Well, it was uh, for Ben. I, I'd watch it. It was like falling in love. Like we saw Owen Wilson when we were casting the Cable Guy, and you could just see it was like a comedy falling in love. You know, we saw a little piece of Bottle Rocket. And we just lost our mind. Like, this is going to be the greatest thing ever. We thought the movie would make $200 million. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, I, and then that happened with Jack Black and with a bunch of people uh, over the years uh, with that. Yeah, so, so when you started off by saying I, I, our, our version of casting is just picking the four people that we know, now that you get the pick of the litter, like, how does that work for you now? How does it work now? Uh, well, you know, you know, sometimes I, I have a lot of energy for casting. When we did Freaks and Geeks, we said, well, let's get real kids. It'll work better with the real kids. So me and Paul and Jake Hasson, we would do open calls. And no one does this. We just go, we're at a school at noon in Vancouver. Anyone can come read for us. And we, a, a thousand people would show up. And we did that in Chicago and New York and, and, and some other places. And, uh, and we found people that way. And then other projects, you, you're just tired. <laughs> and you just realize, I, I'm not going to look at that many people, but this one seems, seems good. But does it feel that. great? Do you give yourself credit for when you look at Freaks and Geeks and the fact that that was, in terms of the Lestat factor, the patient yeah. zero, that you yeah. became patient negative one? Yeah. <laughs> that do, are you, are you, do, you, do, you, do you acknowledge that? Do you feel proud of that? That, that? that every single person in Freaks and Geeks went on to become an entire... You know, cottage industry, and that that actually doesn't usually happen, and that that means that you picked up that Ben Stiller habit. Yeah, I mean, it's so weird now when you really look at it and how deep into the show. And there's a whole other level at the show where, like, Shia LaBeouf was on the show, and <laughs> so these other people, <laughs> you know, who we were discovering people <laughs> that we didn't even. <laughs> Whatever, I'm not going to finish that. So. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it. Uh, you know, all yeah, we thought of was who was great. You know, it's a very weird thing. You know, when you open it up to 
we're just going to hire great kids. We're not going to go, I need a blonde for this. I need a tall guy with this attitude. Just who of every kid that you could show us is great. And we will rewrite, uh, Paul will rewrite the script to tailor it to these people. You can find amazing people, but also I felt terrible about the fact that I knew the show was going to get canceled and all these kids had like foregone college. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and I really, you know, that was the time where there was a, a, a way more young stars robbing liquor stores and things. And I thought, I need to not allow that to happen. My Jewish codependency kicked in. <laughs> And, and so, and I knew they were all great, so I wanted to keep the team together, but I was also afraid for their, their lives. Yeah. They don't do that anymore. Like, like they don't, they, they, I guess they slide over to YouTube and get robbed uh, by yes. Google. Which, which <laughs> but have they you, survive. They which which of you two think is going to play the other one in the movie about the other, the other person? <laughs> <laughs> What's more uh, likely? Uh, yeah, I, I, there's Answer no... my question. <laughs> It just depends. I, I mean, I'll, I'll facilitate this in any way I can. I'll, 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 pl I'll play Judd in a, a movie uh, that's a little darker, more of the. Uh, you were uh, in Funny People. That's, that's right. A lot of people don't know you started my acting career. You and Kyle Kahane. Yeah, yeah, Kyle Kahane. And I, I, I said, I, I said, I, I, you were saying like, oh, these paparazzi guys are obnoxious and they say these terrible <laughs> things, and I was like, really? They say like, like really? And 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 then I. I can't remember if it was in the cut or if it's just like in my memory. It was like I felt I, I felt really bad because I I said to Adam Sandler's character, "Is it was it AIDS or cancer?" And then he he went, <laughs> like like and, and I could, it felt and I saw I, I felt like it was like oh fuck I'm one of those extras that that you pushed it you pushed that, the that, 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 it. He, that he was like Jesus fucking Christ can no. I work or or are you are you done being funny you fucking uh, paparazzi number two you know I was like it was like I, I think the final joke we wound up with or was just that you were just saying like is it true that you're going to be in the Ghostbusters reboot <laughs> is that that must have been Kyle probably uh, that's, 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 that sounds very smart and. Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, well, so, so, but it's, it's, so, so Freaks and Geeks, and then that precedes, uh, uh, uh Larry Sanders show, right? Like, uh, uh, that's, no, that's after Larry Sanders. Oh, shit. Okay, yeah. so now we gotta. I explained all of this in my masterclass.com. <laughs> I mean, we don't $90 have to wait. and you I, get five hours of this. I didn't, I, I didn't know that you worked on Larry Sanders. I, What's I, that? I didn't know that you worked on Larry Sanders. I worked on Larry Sanders, and, the, you know, when we did Freaks and Geeks, in my head the whole time, I would think, uh, I would trick myself into thinking I was still at Larry Sanders and this is just a scene about some of their kids. And I thought if I just write this the way Gary would approach Sanders, right. it'll be right. And, they, and so that was like my little private Was Sam approach. Simon still around on that? Sam Simon was on It's Gary Shandling Show. Oh, so yeah, he wasn't on the other one. Okay. Yeah. Let me ask you something about Larry Sanders because I don't think I've ever, I don't know who I've talked to that's been on that. You, you, you had a hand in it. Uh, <laughs> Um, the, the, it, when I watch it, like, I, I think I did like a rewatch of it a couple of years ago and, uh, what it looks to me like it, well, you guys were developing it, that the, the idea would have been that it would have been this kind of noises off hybrid, that, that, that it was going to be very, the, 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 there was a formula there that we were going to be rooted in the talk show and that it was going to be, um, stories were going to threaten to derail the show as we told it. And then it clearly evolved into a thing where like, we definitely didn't care if we ever saw what was happening on stage, if that was just like a weird uh, mill that, that, that sometimes collapsed or, and, and drove everything. Is that, so, and that, and like, like, can you just describe, like, like, was that an evolution? Am I accurate? In... Uh, I think that Gary, I think Gary said he was at uh, uh, The Tonight Show and he was hosting and there was some sort of problem with Little Richard. <laughs> little, the little Richard was mad about something, and he was watching a producer trying to like calm down Little Richard. And I think that he realized like there's a there's a whole emotional world behind right. this show, which has to do with you know you have this ego maniacal uh, host that everyone is trying to figure out what he wants, and there's a there's all these relationships between the the back crew, and that through the backstage of a talk show you could explore just the entire human condition and I think Gary was fascinated by his own problems with wanting to be successful and famous and, like he hated his own e ego maniacal tendencies and it really, but it, re it really became a show about it was enough 
it could have been a black box theater show that never, that one of the sets, you could have broken down the set of the talk show. Yeah. The, you kept using it, but it was like, it was his office and it was the kitchenette. It was because yeah. it was like, and it was, it was just this crazy, uh, self-loathing like like weird spiraling uh, yeah. portrait of this guy the kind of guy that's good at this job and there's nothing that will make him happy right you know he, he wants success at all costs right. to the you know to the destruction of most of his relationships and it just never works till finally he's pushed off his own show by the younger guy I'm just, I'm, yeah, I'm just curious, which was John Stewart, if I, for, for you space kids, you, you little hologram kids. You don't know no Larry Sanders. You, you, you thought it was It's Gary Shandling Show. Oh, that's... Uh, the, it's uh, streaming on HBO. Go. Uh, also, Little Richards was a black entertainer. <laughs> it was he an was ironic a name. He was a giant. He, uh, he was, I'm certain he was mad about Lucille not doing his sister's wheel. Uh, but, I, but, but I just, uh, what I'm curious about is, do, do you recall a point in some season of that show, the way that I, because I think about Rick and Morty, thank you. Um, uh, you have daughters, I, 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 I'm sure you're familiar. Uh, the, 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 did, that, did that sound, did that make that, it that, creepy that, because that, his kids are daughters? I, we'll, so. we'll, we'll certainly fix that one so every, 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 Everyone with kids, is a, that's my, yes. my yes. in now. I can be like, like, Elon Musk has kids, so I've, be, I've, I've touched the, the fucking spaceman. St Dev, stop it. Stop it. I've got stop Elon touching. Musk. Stop got, touching children. I've got an Elon Musk story. All right. Well, let's, okay. What, I'm going to tell it quick and interesting. Because I'm like, like weird. Oh, okay. So, so I just want to know, is there, was there can, a Can we go where, into a segment called Elon Musk stories? Was the, yes, we can in a second. In a second. The, 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 the current segment is I want to hear this, like, if there's, an, if there's a point that you remember where when you were doing Larry Sanders, where this template that you decided on, where you're like, you know, we had this whole idea of the show, and was there a frustration or a breakdown or an epiphany where someone or some faction or some people said, we don't even have to ever see the talk show in order for this to be a good show? See, I don't think that was the turn. I think the turn was in the first year or two, he had a wife. And, and I think that Gary was writing the wife he wished he had. So he had this, like, professional, the like Catherine Harold's, like, smart woman. And it was almost like, what would a relationship look right. like if I was <laughs> saner? And, 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 it, and it never played uh, the way that, uh, that it, it needed to, because that wasn't the kind of person oh, that Gary okay, dated yeah, yeah. in real life. Um, and, and so there, we did have a conversation once about... Larry should be single because I don't think this is truthful what you're trying to do right. with your wife. And there was also an, an, an ex-wife character. And there were some good episodes and they were great. But as soon as you made him date, mm -hmm. I think that was the moment where it became more about his, uh, you know, his personal life and how frustrated he yeah. was. And, and, and then it became more, more truthful, I think. Yeah, I just when I think of that show, I remember it just this is like him walking into work and yeah. Artie shielding him from everybody, and yeah. him just like in his baseball cap and just in that voice and just like not being able to handle it, and I can't handle it, <laughs> and, and like like I, I like. Yeah, I actually eclipsed. I forgot that there was another part of that show that, yeah. like, did you ever see, remember the Barney Miller pilot? If you watch the Barney Miller well, there was pilot, a lot of his wife. It, wife. it was like the, you could tell the pitch was. Look, cops have two lives. They got their yeah. work family <laughs> and they got their home family because it's like Hal Linden's putting on his and he, he like loves his wife and then he goes yeah. to work with these this like crazy yeah. sweat hog group of like cops and like the show became a one act play yeah. on one set of these crazy cops like Hal Linden never had a wife again. Yeah. But um, it, 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 it's 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 it, 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 the weird connection there is that. The Dick Van Dyke show always struggled with that too, which yeah. was the first thing Gary Shandling brought up in the one encounter I ever had with him, which was right before we lost him. And I haven't been able to watch your your documentary on him because I just I it's 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 it, it, I I also haven't watched Atlanta, so maybe it's for dumb reasons. Yeah. Like maybe it's because like I don't want to watch Judd Apatow be friends with Gary Shandling. Um, <laughs> But but I also I, I I'd like to credit myself and think like actually it's kind of heartbreaking yeah. because as a kid, because he was this meta guy, mm -hmm. and, and 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 I and Sarah Silverman bless her heart someone who was smart enough to recognize that I was she couldn't work with me, and yet still would invite me to her rooftop parties and you know it's, it's That's like, rare. 
<laughs> well, she, you mean rare, rare for a person, not rare for her. Not for her, but yeah, for a person to. Uh, she cast all like, like yeah. yeah she's, she's to just <laughs> embrace that. She's nice, uh, and and uh, uh, and she knew. She, she, she's like, you want to meet Gary Shandling, and it was like, it, it would it would be the la it was the last. I was like, well, yeah, but I. And she's like, you know, like, like dragging, yeah. you know, like it, it, it just just meet him. Yeah. Is, Gary, this is Dan Harmon. You don't know him. D D yeah. And it's just like like putting me at a zoo and mm -hmm. like. Like, it doesn't matter how this turns out for him. And I'm like, Hi, Gary, I'm Dan Harmon. I made a show called NBC Community. I've been recently fired from it. Like, oh, yeah, why? Why did you get fired from it? Uh, and I, said, I think, I mean, I'd, I'd like to think it's because it was uh, too, too inside, too meta. He's like, ah, geez, are they still giving that note? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I was like, and, and then not, because I, that's what I wanted to hear from him because his Showtime show not to admit it's like he yeah. was always the guy where the yeah. painting was part of the frame but he also loves that you're being real with him and that you're you're showing him your pain and that's why he wanted to talk to you because he he really couldn't handle the bullshit right but if you walked up and go like i'm all fucked up right now he's like let's go let's let's get into <laughs> it you know? Yeah, and he but and then he immediately went. The rest was him talking about the Dick Van Dyke show, which I found so interesting because I never even realized what, what, what the Dick was, Van Dyke he, show was meta. He, he, he worked, worked on a goddamn show. He worked on that show. No, no, no. He was saying like, "What does fucking network say?" Like, oh, it's uh, inside baseball. It's about TV, so it's not TV. Fucking Dick Van Dyke worked on my impression is fading. Um, I it turned I into can't, Kumail. I can't tolerate. Your <laughs> that was your, uh, that was the best Kumail Nanjiani impression. But it was, it was and it was so great because it was like 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 wow, this is like the one. I, the, he, like he, he he'll never see my show, but I got to say, uh, the network doesn't like it because they it's about it's about. It's aware, and, and he said, like, my shit's all aware. I'm like, yeah, why the fuck do you think I wanted to meet you? And then he's going, Dick Van Dyke was aware. Television is aware. It's supposed to be. I got a little drunk. Sorry, Judd Apatow. Well, that, <laughs> but that, you know, when but Gary... that's why that's why I've been unable yeah. to watch your documentary because I, I, I it's, it's like, it's like, it's, it, 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 and I also, if you did one about yeah. Harold Ramis, I also would not be able to watch that because yeah. that was a celebrity death that that yeah. buckled my knees. Well, well, how do you think I felt having to like watch? Hundreds of hours of Gary just talking, you know, as a friend. You probably loved it, you ghoul. <laughs> <laughs> Elon Musk story. <laughs> Who, who's going first? Who's going first? Let's we'll start with Dan. Dan, you got the first Elon Musk. I, I, I don't know if he was trying to throw a party, but he throws terrible parties. Yeah. Jed Apatow, you're up. Jed Apatow, Elon Musk story. Okay, before he had the car and he was just like a mystery scientist guy, uh, I was at an Oscar party and, and I was talking to him. I didn't really like know the significance of him. He just seemed like a tall, strange, very smart man. And, uh, and I'm a little drunk and I don't know he was in whatever space he lives in. And... Uh, <laughs> Just the, the regular space. He lives yeah. in the room. And I was it's where his car is. I was it's, it's, and him, that's weird enough. <laughs> You're not supposed to live in space. I was asking him what, uh, you know, what, what he's working on. And he said, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to uh, invent a rocket ship that will go uh, to Mars uh, and back. And then I said to him, there's no way you'll figure that out before you're dead. <laughs> I that kind of reminds me of. Uh, did you ever work with? So I'm guy? fucking Elon Musk one night, <laughs> and I mean I'm fucking him. <laughs> did, you, did you did you ever work with with, with, with Sam Simon? Uh, I never worked with Sam Simon, but although he, I love love loved him. There's a there's a story of <laughs> that, that Jeff uh, like Sam told Jeff this story about himself meeting Bill Clinton, which is that oh yes that, that he, he uh, you know Sam Simon he like uh, the Simpsons and Cheers and Fat Albert and fucking everything oh yeah he created everything I didn't create but he wrote on everything yeah go ahead 
Oh, well, I, 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 I mean, just, I'd be I telling the story for him. Now you can I'm, tell it if you want. I just no, said, no, no, I, 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 I want, said that, that, like, I don't know where what the context was, but Sam was meeting Bill Clinton, and uh, who was currently the president well, yeah. like, when he was meeting him, and uh, uh, and there was some fundraiser, who knows what, and then the president does his like whole line of things, and he's shaking hands. Well, and, it, it, well, okay, well, hey, see, fucking God damn it. <laughs> I, I, I'm only going to give you this. It was a party that it was at a house party in like Bel Air or Beverly Hills, and someone said, "I think the president's coming by," and everyone's like, "No, he's fucking not." And then, well, and it wasn't and, Sam's and, house; it was someone else's I, house. I, yeah, it wasn't Sam's house, but but then Bill Clinton shows up at a house party. There's so, there's so many people in this world that you can be at a Bel Air party and be Sam Simon and it and and be and hear that the president's coming by and it's not your house. <laughs> Uh, like, like that's the, that's so, a lot so, of so, rich so, people. So, so now just take it from there because you, you, you'll have everything else. So then right. the president comes by and he visits. Him. I'm sure it's complicated. When the president comes by, you could probably get shot for passing the mustard. I don't know. They have to. <laughs> I thank God I took square dancing. If I'm ever in that situation. <laughs> but there's a whole line, and I just, all I remember of it, it's, it just comes down to a dialogue couplet. It's like Bill Bill Clinton being introduced to Sam. Sam, Sam, Sam was the, the, the helped create the Simpsons. Of, oh, oh, I love the Simpsons. Oh, uh. <laughs> wait, wait, was Kumail there too? Oh, 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 Andy, Andy, I love the Simpsons. Wait, are you Barney Fife or Bill Clinton? I did not have relations with Mayberry. Um, uh, they're kind of in the same impression uh, category. Me, me and James Adomian, we, we, you, you learn to categorize things. <laughs> Fucking. So Bill Clinton goes, I love The Simpsons. And then, and then like somebody comes up, like there's some kind of like, 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 like me, a guy comes up and, and goes like, Mr. President, it, you, it's all right. You gotta, you gotta go do the thing. And then the other thing you gotta do is even more needing to be done than that. And, uh, and it's just, it's just a bunch of rigmarole and like, 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 oh, uh, uh, and, and, and Bill Clinton, like, uh, he, he's like, oh, well, all right. Well, that's what I mean, these people. And, uh, and, and, it, and, and I guess I got, and, 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 he, and what, what, what's the, what's the setup line? Bill, Bill, Bill Clinton goes, can I just do that? Can I just help? Can Bill, I help? Bill, Bill, just, just the setup line. Bill Clinton's line. I know, I know, I know Sam's punchline. And he goes, he goes, oh, you know, is it, uh, is it, I'm so tired. Uh, there's nothing that happens in the White House that, that doesn't need my looking at, and, and I have to sign everything. I have to look and sign off and, and put a signature on everything. And and Sam goes, tell me about it. <laughs> Sam Simon's my favorite story is he would like season two of have we talked about this? I don't know. I, season two of Simpsons where he goes to the uh, Playboy Mansion. Oh yeah, yeah, that's yeah. I think you, yeah, we I mean, if, you, if yeah, we've told we've done three hundred episodes, so <laughs> you have told it. Yeah, he sees he goes into the grotto, sees a, a little blonde girl. I mean, getting why'd you ask? Getting just fucked in the butt. I'm, I'm doing. The, <laughs> I'm doing the fast version. Okay. He, he's, he's never been invited to the Playboy Mansion. He sees a little young blonde girl getting fucked in the butt by a giant black, you know, football player. And uh, he's watching, and, like, everyone's just taking it like it's no, no big deal. And so he lights up a cigarette, and he's watching it. And security runs in with the earpieces in, like, the ear monitors. And they, they run in, and they go, sir, you can't smoke in here. <laughs> And then, if, if, I'm sure I've told the story eight times on the show. Like 30 minutes later, he's outside the grotto. The girl comes out naked, rubbing her butt, like kind of in pain. And she goes, what was the name of this club again? And I asked Sam, like, what was her line reading? Like, like because I want to call my friends up or fuck this place, like get me the hell out. And he goes, her, her line reading was kind of like, who needs this? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, like, 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 like. Now he's act. dead. Oh. <laughs> third, third act of this is like sort of like. 
I told you backstage because I was I was like, I said, I like, like, well, what am I supposed? I, I am a bad interviewer. Do you? What do you want? Not want to talk about? What do you want to talk about? And you're like, what do you want to talk about? I said, honestly, if I met you at a party, I I would start the conversation with the topic of when is when is it enough? What when, like when is enough enough? And 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 what does that mean? And, and because it circles these areas of like. It, it, the, the fraud complex we've dealt with, that's the road of trials. And I, we don't need to be hooked up to a polygraph and I, don't, I can ask you a thousand times, do you have a fraud complex? And you can either say yes or no and we'll never really understand, like, like do you really, like, do you look in the mirror when you go home at night and go, Judd Apatow, who are you kidding? Uh, like, we I had this know. conversation with my psychic yesterday. <laughs> Honestly, I was, I was talking to a psychic. With your psychic? My psychic, would, would you recommend them? Uh, it's hard to know because I, I was. We, <laughs> it's always hard because I got to see if the predictions work or not. So I, know, I need a little more time to decide <laughs> if the psychic was good. Sure. But there was this psychic that we were talking to because we occasionally like a, a good psychic, and uh, and this woman uh, was just wrong about everything, but really confident. You know, you know. So she's she well, like, you, yeah, you yeah. and your you and your wife, or what? Uh, well, we, we separately. But uh, the, the woman was, was like, you, you like the classic cars? You like the classic cars? Like, you know, your mom's not doing well. She's, she's got the Alzheimer's. I'm like, well, no, she's dead already. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, but she also took big swings at, like, really terrible things happening. You know, like she. Do, so like oh, you yeah. were in Katrina. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's no way to even turn that into... <laughs> But a storm. Yeah, you've, yeah. you've seen your share yeah, yeah. of storms. <laughs> but she did say to me, she goes, you're depressed, right? Right? You thought about killing yourself, right? Right? And I was like, well, no, for, <laughs> for big real? Swings, big for, swings. For real? Oh, yeah. Wait, she, uh, that, that's a fucking, that, it's a, it's that's like a, a home run hitter. If there, was, if there was a psychic movie equivalent of Slapshot or Happy Gilmore, or so, like, 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 fuck, fuck it. Like, 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 there's a, and there's a prude antagonist uh, psychic centrist who's like, you can't read fortunes like that. Like, hey, fuck it. You, you, you fucked Paul Bunyan. No, I didn't. Well, you're gonna. Woo! It's in the way that you use it. So was she was she close? Did she no, she was wrong on everything. Everything. She missed every on everything. Every single thing. Uh, she was wrong. Although, I, but I felt bad because I felt like she looked in my eyes and just thought, like, you know, I think that those people mainly just look at you, and if you're in a good mood, they kind of say things that support that, and if you're in a bad mood, they're like, you're, you're having a hard time, aren't you? And like, I gave off the terrible vibe that that she just thought my life but was she, trouble. But she, she clearly didn't know who you were. She didn't. She wasn't a big Apatow fan. But like, she, she didn't, like, if she knew you, she would have been more, like, a little no, she didn't. on point. Well, she was English. She, she was English. Yeah. <laughs> she, she, that was, she, she's like, this, this is 40, isn't, uh, isn't on cable do, 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 yet. And you're like, no, it is. And she's like, well, not here. Do you, have, you, uh, have you been do, to do, do, do the English? Do the English not, not like, dig your movies? Like, why, why? Uh, in England, do they dig them? Uh, I don't know. I, you know I've, I've gone places, and it never seems to catch on in a big, in a big way. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are pretty anti-British in your. Uh, you know, we, we've worked with the Russell brands and the English people, and <laughs> it doesn't seem to uh, explode the whole thing. I only went to a, a, a psychic one time. I was on a road trip, and I was like, hey, uh, "Fun, you know, go in the psychic." That's what everyone thinks. I, I no one thinks oh, severe. I'll go to a psychic. <laughs> they went out. But I thought it would be an occult experience. I didn't know it would be. Uh, it's it like they, 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 she laid out some. I think she did some tarot cards, or maybe it was palm history. I can't. But but because what I remember is she was like, "Well, you're you want to do this, but you want to do that." It was it was actually yeah. the opposite of what you're describing. Like no, like tiny little weed whacker swings they, that couldn't yeah. help but be accurate. Just like you're con <laughs> you're you're conflicted about something related to your life. Uh, <laughs> like you're good. Uh, it, 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 and it was like, you know, and it, the, the part of you that went in, paid money, is like, that's the smarter move yeah. because you actually are engaging in a self-inventory that could be beneficial. It could be a form of therapy. But then at the end of it, it's like, it just turned into like, this is like, you know, and, you know, you've turned your back on Christ and he just needs to... And it just, everything got Christian and I'm like, wait, how do you know... That's I'm been our show, Jewish. you guys. Thanks for coming. How do you know I'm not Muslim? And aren't you a witch? 
How are you even on this team? When, when, what do you even? When, when I was like 10 years old, I got my palm red, and the woman looks, looks at my hand, and she goes, when you're in your late 40s, you're going to have an injury to your right ear. I'm like, give me, give me this hand back. <laughs> there's, there's, there's no way there's that many lines. There's, it's fucking impossible. Like, we, went, we went to a psychic, and the psychic implied, it was like we were about to go on vacation to Hawaii, and she was like, I'm seeing, uh, I don't know, I'm seeing some windy roads. And, <laughs> and, uh, like, like she was probably we were going to die on the vacation. And so we went to Hawaii and like hid in the room for 10 days. Like, <laughs> Until you realize it's an island. Every road is supposed to be windy. Yeah. Yeah. The dangerous roads would be straight. <laughs> we got scared. But we proved her, I don't know if we proved her correct or not correct because yeah. we didn't die. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Also, I think the same woman, like like two months later, read my hand. and goes, "You're gonna live forever." Whoa! I'm like, Whoa. But what about my fucking ear? <laughs> <laughs> it's like your Thor or something. Like, you're gonna live forever, but you're gonna your brother's gonna take your ear. He's a giant ox. Yeah. Also, I've been told I'm gonna have three children. I think that ship has sailed. So like, like, like everything was a lie. No one's, no, like, nothing's ever been like, accurate about that. Are you, what is that? Let's respect our guest and give him uh, what, what, what time. Oh, look at that. See, I fucking nailed it. I'm so good at this show. <laughs> All right, what are you plugging? <laughs> I'm plugging. I thought we were, I thought we were talking about <laughs> when is enough enough. Oh, yeah, but look, I... Hey, I Judd, can we talk about you uh, being the host on Chop Junior for the next two seasons? <laughs> Yeah, I know. Well, do you have fantasies of retirement? Do you have plans? Uh, you... Well, uh... this, this is Dan asking about whether or not he's allowed to retire. Yeah. <laughs> do you do you think about uh, retiring? Like, do you think uh, like why do you still do it? Uh, I, it be, because it's it's always been for the money, and I hate everyone, and they've always hated me, and I arrived alone, and I'm leaving likewise, and 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 they've been hurtful, and they're gonna miss me when I'm gone. <laughs> And, I, and, and, and to prove it, I just test drove a Tesla yesterday, on uh, Sunday. I, Dan, sorry, Judd, to cut yeah. you off for a second. But, but hold, <laughs> hold, hold your thought there. Dan, you're never going to fucking retire because your, your identity is based on your output. Like, you, you want to be liked and, and to be in the mix. Like, you, you're going to fuck... You're tell gonna, him, Judd, tell him. <laughs> no, 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 Dan, you tell me. You How really, much you, money have you made? Well, I can. Am I allowed to count the uh, money I'm gonna make? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Like hundreds of millions of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't count it until but, you have it, I Judd, don't know, like Judd, ten dollars. You, 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 are you like? Are you like Judd. Ryan? What's his name? Ryan Murphy? Are you? Uh, you have a Ryan Murphy deal? I yes. Probably. Judd, you and I have just met. I I'm, I can guarantee, you, having known Dan for a long, long, long time. He's never going to retire because his identity is too built into the work. He, you, you want to create and you want people to like the things that you create. Judd, do you think, based, you're a storyteller. Uh, is this the character in the movie that is the good friend or the... <laughs> is this the, yeah, is the is drinking buddy that doesn't want you to get married or... Dan, Dan like, <laughs> if, 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 if you went not? off the air, Dan, if you went off the air and didn't have a TV show, didn't have a movie coming out, didn't have a podcast... If I moved to Montana, like yeah, Larry Sanders... You, you, uh, you'd be happy just moving to the hills and, and completely well, switching I off. I, I wouldn't take it that extreme. I mean, like Larry Sanders in that, in that season, like he's a very red thing he has this yeah. fantasy it's like i'm gonna go to a cabin in montana it just becomes this mantra and then like the season ends with he's like they, like there's the cabin he's in montana and it's just like it's quiet he's like Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> but i wouldn't i don't i don't i don't make the mistake of thinking that i don't love attention and that i don't need yeah. to feel the admiration of strangers and all this stuff i i, I simply like i I'm pretty confident that I mean it when I say I would love to wake up one morning and ask myself the question, what do I want to do? Uh, instead, because you're instead of what do I have much, to do? There, there's too much to do to yeah. get all the work done. Yeah, and I think like, I, not I, I, have I, a like, deadline, like to make not a have couple a little dumb movies, like the kind yeah. that, 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 that got you your start and the mm -hmm. kind that, that you know, Shrav and I did Channel 101. It was like, these are the happiest times of our lives yeah. when we were in our 20s and we made these like 
dumb things. And yeah, you make them now, you put them on Instagram, and you just like 40 Nazis go, stop talking about politics. I don't know. Like, but <laughs> who cares about them? I, I, it's not for them. Ugh, I just want to watch them burn. I, 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 <laughs> It's, 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 like, it's like the fulfillment, like I'll make a little song and I'll go like, that feels nice. I think that's the expression on my dad's face when he works on stained glass. He's like, my dad doesn't go, I can't stand not working on VHS duplication anymore. <laughs> my dad doesn't have to be good or bad or lying or honest yeah. in order to be like, I prefer working on stained glass. He's really bad at it. Like, I hope my dad, <laughs> he makes terrible stained glass. Is he, is he a fan of the show? Should we not talk about that? I don't, I don't think so. Because I, I, th I, I think in the 300 episodes of this show, I think even just as an aggregate, we've probably provided tutelage in making stained glass better than he's made. <laughs> On accident. Okay, well, all right. <laughs> I, it's, you, the reason you groaned is because the joke was poorly constructed. <laughs> it's not because it was like a low blow. As it, you, were, you were groaning because you're like, oh, a vat for that? Just to say your dad's shitty? J Judd, how about you? Like, are, are, are you going to be the kind of person that wants to retire soon or uh, work no, until no. You, they put you in the dirt? No, I just, uh, sometimes I think the things that uh, are smaller are less pressure and more fun. Like, it was really uh, enjoyable to you know, work on uh, the documentary. I made a documentary about the Avett brothers and the, about Daryl Strawberry and Dwight Gooden. And I, I find that I'm getting more and more joy out of the things I don't get paid for. Have you been able to find some place where you don't, are, 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 like, your, what is your relationship with people's opinion of you? Of as far, yeah. Like, like, cause, yeah. Uh, like, like, so, because how do you, because I'm only to the place where I can go, oh, fuck them. That's the healthiest yeah. I can get. Yeah. But, uh, Even the ones who like you. Uh, no, 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 not fuck them. No, <laughs> a, a thousand camels for that for for their children. I, I, I no, I, ju I just mean like like it's 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 like oh uh, that relationship can hurt me. Yeah. So fuck it. Yeah. But you you're about to tell me how to get a relationship where you're like actually it's okay for them to say fuck you, Judd Apatow, you straight white fucking privileged piece of shit yeah. that's never fucking black, fuck you and your ha hacky bullshit. Oh, the, when you're on every billboard because you're a piece of shit, fuck yeah. you. And, like, like, and, then, and then you're, you're able to go like, Hey, okay, hey Judd, that one, Judd that one. you're allowed to leave whenever you want. <laughs> yeah. But like you... you but you feel there's like, there's like a debate on the work that's happening that there's some people the, the, who love the, the, it and there's some people who enjoy... Yeah engaging with you and attacking you for different but reasons. There's not, there's not even a debate on the work. Like, uh, maybe this is, uh, like, like, it's like, oh, the work's great. Is it ever going to make this guy a good person? Yeah. Why what, do they like, think you're a bad person? I'm a bad person. Yeah. <laughs> but why are you a bad person? Well, ironically, uh, <laughs> a lot of... Shut up and I just called you a bad person. And no, I want, no, I, I want that to go on record. I, 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 I would like to think, ironically, it's because, well, I had work to do. You had work to do, and that made you a bad person? Yeah, I did. Well, my work wasn't in the area of uh, uh, being a good person. <laughs> that you were focusing on your own ego and your own success was, was, and like, not well, helping anybody. Like if somebody came up and said, like, hey, can you help me open this soda? I'd be like, uh, how is that going to make television good? Yeah. <laughs> so and they go, the we're point. eight. And I'm like, well, bitch, you better fucking figure it out. Yeah. Because I'm going to be controlling TV one day, and you're going to be opening sodas. Yeah. And, and as you compound that for 40 years, yeah. but it's like, is there a difference between our breed? Are you a, are you, are you a, are you a, you're a, you're a, you're a more likable person, right? Yeah. Like you're, like, like, like. I, I think this crowd likes you more than me, so you're wrong. They're self-abusive. Like, yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah. like, so, so yes, you're right. They do, but they, they, because they've con they, they conflate. Uh, uh, loathing with authenticity and so then I they're see. like ah I like him because he hates himself that gives me a break from hating myself it's terrible we're all unhealthy I see yeah, yeah. that's true that's but true. that's why we have guests like you yeah. to invite us upward and so I think we're all asking you yeah. do you have a secret can we escape this <laughs> <laughs> well I used to be I mean I think I used to have a lot more of your energy early in my career because I remember I was working on the Bed Stiller show and they gave me all these terrible notes and I said to the guy, I said, uh, well, I'm not doing any of them. What happens now? Ah! Yeah! <laughs> yeah! And then we got canceled. And, uh, and I did the same thing. And you won an Emmy! 
Yeah. And then I did the same thing on Freaks and Geeks and we got canceled. I did the same thing on Undeclared and we got canceled. And then I made this pilot with the great Dave Herman, you know, from Office Space and uh, King of the Hill. And uh, he had a beard. He played a pro officer. And uh, the, the head of the network said, uh, I want you to reshoot. We were three days into shooting the pilot. I, I want you to reshoot everything because I don't like the beard because only uh, villains and pirates have beards. <laughs> And so then the head of the production company came to me and said, you, you, can you do this? Will you reshoot everything you've done? But we had been like improvising for three days. Like you couldn't really recreate what had happened. And he, he looked better with the beard. He was kind of a grizzled guy. And, and I said, I, I don't think I can do it. Like I don't think that it will be better without the beard. And she said, if, if you don't shave the beard, there's no chance this show will get picked up. I'm like, really? Like she will hold that against me. Uh, like she begged me to make a show, but you hold it against me and not pick it up only because of the beard. She said, yes. And I'm like, well, well I'm not shaving the beard. And, uh, and then they didn't pick up the show. <laughs> <laughs> so I have had Dan Harmon years. I did, uh, it's, I did, like, keep uh, going. I, 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 wait, was there a dead man's curve where you're like, I can't do it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there was, there was a dead man's curve, which is I was working on the 40 year old virgin. And uh, I was like, again, I was like three days in, we had only shot two things we shot he was like remember when there was like a bus that had all this like sexy signs on it and he was just running away from this bus with, with a perfume ad on the side and uh, and so we shot that and then we shot this speed dating sequence you know and uh, the studio saw it and then someone from the studio you know, in the middle of the day called and said shut the movie down and they said you know steve looks like a serial killer and, and paul rudd looks fat and you're lighting it like an indie, but it also felt like they didn't really understand the, the style <laughs> comedically of what we were doing. Oh, well, clearly. And, and that was usually the moment where I would like, you know, burn everything down and, and right. you know, we wouldn't start up again. And for the first time in my career, I went, okay, I'm gonna listen to everything they say. Because someone said to me, when you, would you tell people their notes are stupid? You're basically calling them stupid, and then they make it their mission to destroy you. And that's their reaction. This is all in the master class, by the way. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, and so I said, don't, just don't do it. Just listen to the notes. Just don't, maybe there's a way to do the notes. And so she's like, well, he, he looks like a serial killer. And I said, well, because uh, he's wearing like a tan, like, a Jeffrey Dahmer jacket all the time. And I said, well, we probably could make that maybe like a running gag that everyone tells him he's looking like a serial killer. That's good, I like that. And, and, and then we did that and it became a, a big part of the Hang story. Hang a lantern on it, we call yeah. that. Yeah. I made you up, don't address the note, yes. you make the note part of yeah. the script. I actually made up a comedy term that no one uses, which is a, a certain joke is a, a, a turd in a slipper. With, a, a, a slipper? A turd in a slipper, which basically means like you, like you put your foot in a, <laughs> a, a, in a slipper with a turd in it, and it's a, a joke that feels good, but it's not right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, the, 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 if, if this episode's not called Turd in a Slipper, I quit. <laughs> but then yeah. I, couldn't, I couldn't make Paul Rudd skinnier because I, I wanted Rudd to be to be fat, you know, like I, I, I thought, you know, he was always so cute and like clueless and I was always like, I, I, I like him like when he looks like he's falling apart. And, uh, and so I said, I'm gonna make Paul lose weight, <laughs> but it was yeah. too late, you know. You, wanna, <laughs> you wanted to poop in his slipper. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, the lighting is the lighting. And then I realized like, oh, this didn't even make sense shutting us down. Like she could have just called and said, hey, keep an eye on these three things. It's there. Yeah, th that happens a lot where like, th an email will come in and it's like their choice to make it seem catastrophic. Yeah. And so their language is catastrophic. And so you inherit that. And yeah. then you go, well, then defiance is the only, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm just beating that horse. But it's like, that, that is why it's worth like breathing and going, what's the note behind the oh, note? And how do you actually do this? Like, let them be <laughs> hysterical. And, and, and go like, actually, this is this is as most notes is addressable. Yeah, no, it, it took and, and the way to be time. defiant is to prove that that serves your ego. You go like, actually, you guys think it's hard to make him not look like a serial killer. All you had to say is please. Yeah, and and, and you like you can retain your ego and your. But it's like, so hard because when they give you the notes, what you're thinking is I'm funny, and it's, it, it because it, it, yeah. because that's linked to. 
the presupposition that you didn't, you don't know what you're doing, yes. right? Yes. It has to be because if you really knew, when you really have confidence, isn't your? It's like actually dumb shit saying like, "Are you sure this should be a thing?" Yeah. Like, like, isn't it yeah, kind of yeah. like, I was like, do you want us to engage in the humiliating ritual of changing yeah. it for you? Yeah. <laughs> like, like you kind of like, you have that like yeah. po power, that Harry Potter scar in your head. I think for me, it was, I, I like for me, the reason why I'm also that confident, it's yeah. no, I'm not. I, 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 but, but I just realized, I don't know if maybe was that moment, did that coincide with you? A relationship that uh, in your personal life, a daughter born or a a, well, a, yeah, a, a wife think, married, that you're like, I gotta stop making bridges out of firewood. Well, I, you know, I had a I had a realization, uh, which is okay, anything something anytime something would happen like with, with the, the show or even a scene or anything going wrong, I, I would just lose my shit, and my wife would always make fun of me. And, and just, you know, just be like, oh, nightmare on the set, nightmare on the set. And like, <laughs> mock me, you know, <laughs> meltdown on the set, what will you do? And, and she just so laughed at me for the fact that I would go to 10 on things that weren't that important. And, and I made a connection at one point. I was in this giant fight. I wanted to direct uh, this, the pilot that, that with Dave Herman. I couldn't get them to let me direct it. They, they said no. And I was just losing my shit. And I realized that I was treating the head of the network like my mother. <laughs> and that I was uh, looking to, there were two heads of the network at Fox. I, I, I think they were like my mom and dad getting divorced. And that I had the energy of like a 14 year old fucking flipping out with them. <laughs> and I'm like, this isn't what's happening. I have different energy than what's actually going wrong here. Yeah. And as soon as I realized I was treating the head of the network like my mother, I, I made a choice to find people who understood what I do and that I wouldn't be in fights if I really spent more time going, what executive gets the joke? Right. And ever since I've done that, it's all easier, but you have to, you have to really, I remember I met Larry Gelbart. And Larry Gelbart wrote the movie uh, Neighbors, the one with John Belushi and uh, Dan Aykroyd. And he said he went out to dinner with the director, and the director wasn't funny. But he didn't do anything about it. He was just like, he wasn't funny. And then like two weeks into shooting, he's like, this is a disaster. And he said he realized like at that moment, I gotta pull the plug on the whole thing. I have to make on, sure- On, on these neighbors? Are, uh, yeah, that yeah. these are the right people. Like if I don't, if I don't have yeah. the right team around me, the whole thing is screwed. And so that's what I tried to do, is slow down and go, who really understands me? But, but an argument could be made that, that that guy that melts down, that that's what he's trying to do. He's, try, he's trying yeah. to make the, he's going, this isn't right, you're not right, you don't get me. This email yeah. is you being a person that can't work with me. It, 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 and so we have these stories where, oh, okay, and then I rose and I breathed and I became yeah. a better collaborator, but then you just undercut it right there because yeah. it's like, that's just as true too. It's like, yeah. yeah, if you don't have chemistry, how are you ever gonna make anything work? Yeah. The, 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 you didn't know you were allowed to not cast uh, your friends yeah. in the Ben Stiller show. That's, sure. the, that's the Emmy winning sketch show. Like, they laughed at me when I said, let's, let's have Seth Rogen be the lead of Undeclared. They literally started laughing. <laughs> <laughs> like it was so ridiculous and uh, but I think that at some point you realize like all this energy I put into my meltdown it's not actually making anything better it's making me sick and is there any way to no. just not do it only because it's it's exhausting at some point to is, be is, in that place. Is, is there a part because like I, I, I I'm not like a, a uh, an employer you got you guys have things that go on where you have a hundred people that work, you know, with you, underneath you, like, and you're making... Yeah, you could have fooled me with the way you're pushing this sports drink uh, backstage. <laughs> I don't know, I thought I was... I, I just thought I'd invent some weird thing that Jeff has a sports <laughs> drink company, like... It didn't land. <laughs> How is he famous, Jeff? How is... <laughs> between you and me, why is Dan even here? I know, but, but uh, like, w when you're like in a creative space and you have all these people underneath you that are, are reliant upon you, how much does that weigh into your like, daily decision making? At all or not a bit? 
Well, it depends on the pro project because sometimes you know you're working with people and you go, "This is their big break." Like, so if I fuck this up, Amy Schumer is screwed. <laughs> she's <laughs> not gonna get. She's not gonna get another movie. I gotta do a good job. I'm gonna really hurt her long-term prospects. And I, I think about it, but it, it's worse when I work with my kids because I just think. I'm going to make my children a laughing stock around the world. Yeah. And, and also, there's, there's wardrobe people, the makeup department, and all these like grips and yeah. carpenters so, and all this people, stuff. I don't know. It's, it's like, cause the, 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 I was I was kind of happy about one aspect of the Roseanne thing, which was that actually for the first time in mainstream media talking about the television industry, yeah. there was a big talking point that was 200 people lost their jobs. Yeah. And, and 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 I'm not saying oh that was a great talking point or as bad. It's just like we never really talk about that. And also, it's not always true. Every day that Sony came to a table read on Community, they, they, their theme was actually, you're fucking 200 people over with your shitty, late, yeah. crazy Dungeons and Dragons scripts. That's why I kept saying to them, you know, you can always fire me. And all these guys that saw wood and haul cable will be as safe in your fucking loving arms as yeah. we want. It, it, it kind of like, it, 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 sometimes that fraud complex goes, I'm actually, I need to get out of here to save people hauling cable. But do you think, I, I, I know this sounds weird, but everyone in show business is in the circus. So it, this isn't like people have been working at Ford for 25 years and the show goes down and they never get a job again. They all just jump on another fucking Hulu show. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like it I sucks, mean, but, but, and you might have three or four bad months. That, that, but, that, that's if they're lucky, but I, I think that a lot of people is like, like when somebody, like when Kevin Spacey gets Kevin Spacey and the House of, <laughs> House of Cards just dies, there's some probably 150 people that said, oh, fuck, I just got hired. Like, I, I, I thought I had a No, it, no sure. it definitely sucks. I, I mean, it definitely sucks. It's, it's awful. But... You know, all these shows are like eight episodes or ten episodes, and there's right. so much demand for crews, for shows, that like the, the, the biggest part of it, I mean, you know who gets screwed is like certain actors or actresses, they can only work on that show. Mm -hmm. You know, there are certain people on Roseanne, you go, this is the, where they're going to score in this show. You know, yeah, well, I, I guess my question wasn't so much about the like the, the, the grand picture of Laurie Metcalf being out of a job. It, yeah. It's it's the fact that like w w when you're writing an episode, fighting with the network, fighting with the studio, having your own little like tug of war. How much do you think about the fact that you're that you're in charge of a lot of people? Well, I only think about it in the sense that there's a big crew, and I, I and I, this sounds like bullshit, but I really think I, you know, I'd like this all to work well for them, so that they all feel respected. If anything goes gets weird, they can yeah. come to me, and it will be dealt with, and that like we're like a happy but that's not, family. That's, that's not a big burden on you as you're doing the. Creative. It's not hard to do. It's it's not hard to be pleasant and right. nice to the people who work for you, like the people. Who who are a nightmare? Uh, it, it requires more energy. How much time? Like like how many sets, crews, like uh, shows have you been on where it was a fucking nightmare? Because like I, I've been very lucky to work in comedy where everybody's nice. Yeah. And only maybe one or two times people were shitty, but that's like really rare. Like like the, yeah, I haven't had a lot of those experiences. I, like a director can be shitty and be yelling at the crew and yelling at the dolly grip that they, they miss the mark like you do see that like somebody who yeah. is so obsessed with doing a good job they're mean to people around them but i think everyone has bad days where are, they do are you, that are you do you think you're good at cultivating a like an environment of happiness and fun and grooviness i'm the least fun person on the set <laughs> i i'm not fun i you know like for, like i don't know how you are like you know when, when you're working on episodes and you're on set i I am so nervous that the day is not going well that my main thought is I need to figure out a way to seem like I'm in an okay mood for everyone around me because what's in my head is uh, so unpleasant. But that's good. Well, for you, me, you, like, I find myself, I, I get so easily fixated on what they're doing that, and then I, over time, over a couple of seasons, I, I objectively notice because I love being in the edit bay. And uh, I, there, and I love being in the writers' room. And then I would sometimes go to the set where they're shooting the things that you wrote in the writers' room that you labor over, and then that you're gonna have to edit. And what I would notice is that me on the set yeah. was like, you, you might as well throw a 
bucket of chicken bones yeah. in the air and and adjust the set the way the chicken bones implied yeah. Be, because because it was basically like it's like, like yeah, sometimes the chicken bones are going to be right sometimes yeah. raw it's like like outside of like any it's like i'm not my instincts for for, for actors and how yeah. to communicate with them like eh, yeah might as well roll the dice well i i agree with that to a point uh i i you know, when a show's going well, you know, we're shooting Crashing right now, we have great directors. I don't feel like when I sit on the set, uh, it, it's essential to what's happening. And, you know, I'm always thrilled when an episode comes in and it's incredible and I can go, I was not there for one second. Yeah, I, I felt on Funny People, like, I had that, you know, and I was like, Judd's, Judd's got his ass plopped in this director's chair. It's like, we're burning money here. He could be off developing something. I got this. <laughs> Uh, but, 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 yeah, I... Is that the only time you've worked with Janusz Kaminski? Uh, <laughs> wait, I don't know what... To, what uh, That's a cinematographer who did the funny people. Oh, is he? Oh, and Lincoln. Why are they always, uh... Polish? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, no, I, I guess Polish, but, like, they're, they're always, like, some, like, they, they, they smoke cigarettes with their hand yeah. back or... Like why? Why are yeah. they always from some strange he came, land? He, he came to America, and the, he's the, you know he's one of the best uh, ever. And, and the first movie he did was uh, the Vanilla Ice movie, Cool as Ice. <laughs> that's, Which, that's how he for, started. F- for my money, holds up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool uh, as Ice is fucking like it's still it's still as true as it was the day it was made. Is there any way? I hate I I, I hate this question. I always thought like. Like we've connected with you, you're at the you're at the top of the tornado, which means you're either gonna be flung off and be a cautionary tale of the velocity of a human body, or or end up somewhere random. Uh, like as what part legend. is the best part of the tornado to be in? Top, or, top or bottom? Top no. center, and then you like end up like it's like like Ripley's Believe It or Not, Judd Apatow <laughs> was in Kansas when this tornado sucked him up. He ended up sitting in Hawaii, happily married, <laughs> uh, that, as opposed to like whoa, fuck him. Um, which is what the but 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 like you so far so good yeah you're doing all right yeah you started like scrapping and wanting and you've been transparent about it like there's 190 people in here some of them are surely bad people some of them are good people uh, a lot of them I, is you there, guys are all good people <laughs> Don't. is there is there is there any way to like 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 after all of these decades of you with these these roller coasters, like I, it's dumb. It's like that's yeah. what they always want. What's your advice to young people? Is what yeah. I'm saying. Uh, well, what is the you know, you know what is the the advice <laughs> to young people? It could take the form uh, of like maybe the, a more practical way of asking it because it might get a more sincere answer. Is what do you wish? What do you wish you could poke your what's head your through Doctor Strange hole and say what, to yourself? What's your advice to Dan Harmon so he's not so freaked out right now? No, what do you wish you could say to yourself at pick an age? Yeah. I mean, if you want to pick 17. Well, I think, you know, the one thing that I got out of uh, being around Gary was, uh, because I never thought about any of the things that he talked about before meeting him, in terms of you write from a personal place, you're trying to learn who you are through your creativity. Uh, you know, he was a guy who didn't, uh, he wasn't really part of the system. Like, he made these shows, but he, he didn't seem like he was a... A, a, a part of show business, you know, it, it, like he just did his things on the side and he was almost like an independent filmmaker in doing his TV shows. And I think there's a lot to be said for uh, caring that passionately about whatever you're doing and uh, being willing to dig deep. And then if you have something to say, people might connect with it. You can't really succeed if you're just trying to be a cog in the machine. You, you're really trying to figure out what you want to express to other people, and I, you know, like for me, I, in a very simple way, I think I'm j- over and over just trying to say, you know, don't be an asshole, try to be nicer, try to grow, uh, and that every movie is like a fucking idiot, try to be less of a fucking idiot, you know, and that's all it is. And I'll, I'll think I'm reinventing the wheel, and I'll sit in a story meeting, and then by the end of the meeting, we've kind of cracked the story, and I'm like, yeah, it's just another version of that, yeah. and that's what it is. Do you notice that in your work? Like, there's a, a common theme that no matter how hard you try to get away from it, you're landing on it again? No. <laughs> what are your, what's, what are your what's, themes? Do you have any Jeff, like, like, uh, what, what, Dealing with uh, being brilliant. 
Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I think control is it's yeah. it's it's like it's like a, it's it's sort of like every episode of Community and Rick and Morty. Like it's so easy for it to come around to. Oh, we're talking about control versus not control. Yeah. And it always makes me feel like, wait, wait are we doing this right or wrong? Is every story about yeah. the human ambition for control, or are we fucking up? Yeah. Are we just like going back to a golf swing that is basically like killing our shoulder? Like like, like are we supposed to be different than this? Are we supposed to be telling stories about fucking? Yeah. Uh, uh, what happened to you that you're obsessed with the idea of control? This is a whole different show. Because <laughs> I've never heard anyone talk about that as a theme, but I'm fascinated by how it works. Well, because I'm, I'm terrified of being a control freak. It's, yeah. it, it, like, like, like more so than I... It's, it's, it feels like I'm a control freak. I feel like control freaks worry about not having control, and I find myself waking up every day and going, I'm, a, I'm terrified I'm going to be a control freak. I see. But we don't have, come on. We've, but but also, everyone, but, but, but everyone but, is a control freak. It's just like how you carry it. Like, I'm sure there's no difference between how I'm controlling things and how you're controlling things. It's just how we're acting around the office. Yes. Yes, and we, it's, it's, it, that brings us to Twitter and this new age where it's like, oh, I'm, like, has any of this become cash inable? Like, like, it, or is is the is the common man uh, or lady? <laughs> you can be common. Um, <laughs> the, the, are they? Are can I can I finish? Like, can it, can they say you're all right? You did it, but but not mean you did it. Like you made three branded content videos that won a Chloe. <laughs> like you, you meaning like no because you did all that stuff. All right, you're not gross anymore. Like you're not like, like I, I touch your hand in square dancing. Like I, like like I wouldn't. It's not. That's not saying I date you, but I wouldn't like. I wouldn't. I wouldn't go to the cafeteria and and. And and say I can't believe I had to, uh, that getting a Phi Ed credit required touching that person. Yeah. Um, can you can you can you ever take the journey that would like? Can you undo that? Can you be less gross by making shit? That's no. interesting. <laughs> I think you hate yourself in a different way than I hate myself. <laughs> All right, let's. No, I, I wasn't even. <laughs> I was just kidding. Uh, well, I, hope, I, I, I hope you come I, back some time and... Can I ask... <laughs> how much self-loving goes into being a great, like, show creator? Like, 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 like do, you, do you feel that, like, a little bit of self-loving is a part of what you make, Jed? I, you know, I think I got lucky. Uh, you, know, I, you know, I see my career in two phases, which is I had all these shows canceled, and I, I felt like they were good, and I had movies that didn't do well, like Cable Guy and Heavyweights that I liked. And I was like, I think I'm out of sync with the world. Like, the things that I like, I think they are good, but I don't think, I guess I'm never going to transcend and, like, connect with the audience. And then I, you know, was lucky enough to meet Paul Feig, and we worked on Freaks and Geeks. And then when that was over, I had a very visceral sense that something magical had happened. Like, this is weird. Like, this came out exactly the way we wanted it to. Was it's, it before the public reacted or was it it almost was disconnected the from the reaction of the audience it was just a personal feeling like i think for me this is as good as i can do and i think it works perfectly the way we wanted it to and as a result i'm going to look at the rest of my career as like an aftermath mm. and so like you know it's almost like a trick on myself like i did it once so i could take all that pressure off of myself and just try a bunch of shit because I really only wanted to prove to myself once that I knew what I was doing and that everything else can be an experiment. So identify the top of your APA tower. <laughs> no, that didn't work. Does that make any sense? Uh, the connection of APA tower and then the word tower? Yeah. A, a little too much. Yes. But, but, but I, I, I'm getting. No, that's that. no I, I did. I, Joel Hodgson came to an epiphany. You know, Joel. Yes, you know, yes. Like about mystery science theater. Like he had a love hate relationship with it because of what it represented in his life. And so he kind of you you got lucky enough to 
sounds like you're in the edit band, Freaks and Geeks, and you're like, you know what? If I think it's going to get better than this, um, I, I, I may be right, I may be wrong, but one thing's for certain, I have unreasonable expectations if I compare. Yeah. That's how I feel about Rick and Morty. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like, I'm like, I, 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 community was fucking perfect, therefore, like, I, I, like, Rick and Morty, I'm like, if you ever expect to be yeah. this happy about something you've made, like, like you're dumb. Uh, and that doesn't mean you're not going to, and it doesn't mean you you are. It's just, but it's like it's it's that it is that atoning with like good enough is good enough. Yeah. Um, or just not even good enough. Just I'm giving myself to it. I'm being as creative as I can be, and I have the courage to put that out there, and we'll, we'll see what it is. Like I'm not holding back. I'm not trying to obsess on how people are going to feel about it. Right. I, it's a pure expression. Because you're not you're not letting yourself be defined. Hi, sorry. That happens a lot. <laughs> I'm hidden. Um, but you find your, like, you're, you're taking the pressure off yourself and you're not letting yourself be defined by your work. So in that sense, it's not about your ego. It's really just about focusing on the thing that you're doing. Yeah, can you get to that place? Right. And then, but there's always that other part of you that's like, I'm gross. You know, you're, right. you're aware well, that. that we carry with you're us. trying to let the dominant thing be, I'm going to try to be in flow on whatever this creative expression is and put it out there. And whatever, whatever yeah. happens, I mean, it's happens. Not, it's not fair to people to, to, to like, it's like a writer on a contract that the audience didn't sign. Go, oh, do you like that show, Mighty Mouse? Yeah, it's great. Uh, hey, did you know the guy that created it wants you to think that he's a good person? Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not prepared to have that conversation. <laughs> Um, I'm, what I'm very prepared to tell you yeah. is that I enjoyed Mighty Mouse episode yeah. three yesterday yeah. and may change my mind tomorrow and have a full fucking right to. Yeah, and, uh, yeah it's, uh, like that's the, the, I think, the lesson I just learned tonight. And but really that's the fuel. Uh, yeah. But that's like the fuel. Like your fuel to do the work sometimes is, I'm gross. Are you we know? boring you? He just yawned. Who, me? Oh, yeah. That's how I'm no. Sorry. no, but that, that's like your fuel. J J J like you can't do the work. Unless you have some like insane wound you're trying yeah. to like overcompensate for. And so the real question is at a certain age, could you go, I can find a different fuel than this weird insecurity, right. self hatred, and do it from a different place? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the metaphors there would be, it could include like aerospace, where it's like it takes a different form of propulsion to get like, yeah. you know, to certain places. And then it's like, Things need to detach and take over, or you're a bad rocket. Like you're yeah. flying on fucking diesel to the moon. Um, how, or, or how, like how does Jan, pole vaulting? How, how does Dan get as mellow as you? Like, like, how, 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 like, what could what could he learn from you? How to be? Well, your worst nightmare needs to become a reality for that to happen. Because every Go. seat's filled in here because of my mania. <laughs> Go ahead. You can tell him. Go ahead. Tell him. What would it take to make me? Mellow? I'm just saying, calm the fuck down, motherfucker. I'm not the one. I've been, I've been, like, I've been like, haven't we done too much show? Like, <laughs> no, I thought I was the. We're, 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 Do you we're, think you're in uh, pre-crazy, prime crazy, or post-crazy? I said like right at the tip of the Apa Tower. Like yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> like I, I, I feel like I, I'm, like, I'm like right at the place, which isn't. It's, it's like. My therapist said to me, she goes, because she goes, I describe all whole situation, 70 episodes, whatever. I, I, I walked her through the merch. <laughs> <laughs> and I, said, I mentioned you three times in my GQ article. Um, uh, and, she, and, she, and she goes, so next is happiness, huh? And I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I go, yeah, for sure. Pretty cool, right? And she's like, huh. Now this will be interesting. This will be interesting. <laughs> And, and, and I'm like, what's that about? And, and, and she goes, no, no, no. I just, I'm saying it's going to be interesting because you're an archetype. And uh, about half of you, uh, that's true. You, now you become happy. And now you just actually just grow to your randomly allotted age. And you just die with a smile on your face or, or, or with a look of shock because maybe it's a bus. Um, <laughs> Uh, but 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 the other half to the point where you could flip a coin and she's like very convincing I don't know if maybe she's bullshitting with this stuff, but she's like she makes it sound like science She's like the archetype you are in the situation you're in the half of you uh, Now you die Now you put on slippers as she said and you drink yourself to death 
because you don't know how to process happiness. And I was like, all right. <laughs> I, and she's like, yeah, huh, it's going to be, going to be, going to be interesting. Well, this... like, what is your job? Cliffhanger. <laughs> Slippers full of poop. Thank you so much, Hayworth Theater. And the uh, Dynasty typewriter. Can we give it up for Judd Apatow? Judd Apatow? Thank you, Judd. Spencer Crittenden. And as always, Church, Chris, Sarah, Levy, Brian, Yusa, Nolan, everybody. Also, all of you for coming out and seeing us live here downtown in the red capital of Los Angeles, California. We love you. Drive fast, take chances. Zach McKeever, put some beats on. Did you get any of that? It's a good show.